case. Right now. Respected all, wish you a very good evening. I am Dr. Shubhanga Tiwari, final year PG resident at Base Hospital Delhi CAN. I'll, I'll be presenting on COMS commerce disease. My patient, Mr. Gaurav Tripathi, 22 year old, serving in army, a resident of Palam, Delhi. He presented to us with complaints of discharge from left ear since one year duration and decreased hearing from both ears since one year duration. Go to the next slide. Um, slide. Um, slide is uh, yeah, moving. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it has come. Yes, ma'am. Coming to the history of present illness, the ear discharge patient came with complaints of ear discharge from his left ear since one year duration, which was insidious in onset. The discharge is continuous, thick, purulent, green in greenish in color. The discharge is scanty, blood stained, and foul smelling. The discharge is not aggravated by URTI and not relieved on using topical ear drops. There were no other aggravating or relieving factors. There is no complaint of discharge from his right ear per se. Patient also complains of decreased hearing from his both ears since last one year duration. Left ear more than the right ear. The onset is insidious progressive and there is a continuous hearing loss and he complains that he cannot hear whisper from his left ear and has decreased hearing conversation which is affecting his routine work and he also uses his mobile phone with the right ear no history of associated otalgia i'll just like to interrupt you in between can you go back to your previous slide no no chief complaints So it is a 22 year old male, uh, uh, yeah, male with history of discharge left ear since one year duration. Yes, but however, he has decreased hearing both ears. Yes, ma'am. This is your history? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, like it will come later maybe, but I, I, am, um, I would like to ask you, what is the uh, cause of hearing loss for his other ear? That is right. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, on examination, we found out that, that he was having disease in both of his ears, ma'am. He was so having disease. He was disease in... presenting complaints. Yes, ma'am. Only hearing was his main concern. Yes, ma'am. Hearing and discharge from his one ear, left ear, sir. Okay. Okay. Go to your next next slide. Okay, continue with your uh, that other history. Right now. Questions later. There is no history of otalgia, tinnitus, vertigo, or oral fullness. There is no history of associated fever, swelling, and pain behind the ear, facial asymmetry, nausea, vomiting, neck pain, and stiffness, and altered sensorium. There is no history of there is no history of any direct trauma to ear, no history of any head injury or exposure to loud noise or any consumption of ototoxic drugs and no history of any nose or throat complaints. Coming to past history, there is no known chronic illness in the patient and no history of any surgery in either of the ear. Coming to personal history, he consumes mixed diet denies any history of smoking or alcohol intake, bowel and bladder habits are normal with a normal sleep and normal appetite. Coming to family history, there is no history of similar complaints in the family and no history of any allergic diseases in the family. Coming to treatment history, the patient has intermittently been using topical eardrops and there has been no history of any surgery in the ear, nose or throat. Shall I summarize the case, ma'am? Yeah, 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 yeah summarize it. Ma'am, 22 year old male patient without any com comorbidities 
came with complaints of otorrhea left ear since one year duration and hearing loss both ears since one year duration the discharge is continuous scanty thick foul smelling and blood stain he also and associated with history of hearing loss both ears left more than the right since one year duration okay subhankar so what could be your probable diagnosis on the basis of your history that you have given ma'am uh, based on the history till now ma'am the disease can be cums comus active disease ma'am uh, without any complication ma'am with the moderate with with the moderate hearing loss which we, we can uh, check in the examination we will we'll do later ma'am okay so you you suggest that probably it is a squamous squamous disease ma'am type of cum yes ma'am okay so go back to your slides where you have described the history of this uh, uh, described your discharge part so what is the what are the points in favor of your diagnosis ma'am uh, in the favor of diagnosis the first thing is the scanty amount of discharge the foul smelling of discharge third is blood stain discharge fourth is continuous discharge which is thick purulent and greenish color of the discharge all these things suggest that uh, suggest towards squamous nature of the disease ma'am okay particularly you have pointed out greenish color of discharge yes ma'am does it signify anything ma'am infection with pseudomonas so probably he is having pseudomonas infection yes ma'am how will you treat a case of uh, discharge having pseudo of pseudomonas origin ma'am if the patient comes to me first of all we'll do oral toileting and uh, we'll preferably take uh, ear swab and set it for culture ma'am and we'll start him on broad spectrum antibiotics and wait for the culture report uh, and based on that we can further modify the treatment ma'am and we'll advise him for regular oral toileting so that uh, the ear will be kept dry suppose the ear is not drying and the organism has been uh, uh, cultured as pseudomonas ma'am so what else you can do ma'am we can uh, uh, apart from giving a topical antibiotic drops ma'am if it is not uh, if it is not uh, controlling with the topical antibiotics and giving a course of systemic antibiotics we can give a give a few uh, wash with the acetic acid ma'am to change the ph of ear ma'am okay so what is the concentration of the acetic acid that you use 0.003% ma'am i'm not sure ma'am are you sure no ma'am okay if you don't get the prepared solution in the pharmacy what else you can do bedside or instruct the patient it is easily available at home maybe you are using it in food or not ma'am vinegar we can use in some recipes vinegar ma'am yeah diluted vinegar you can use yes ma'am okay so and can you tell me why Yes, yeah, yeah, enough yeah, to proceed. Uh, can you tell us the difference between uh, ear discharge in squamosal and mucosal disease here? Yes, ma'am. On comparing comparing the discharge with that of the mucosal, ma'am, the mucosal discharge is generally profuse. The patient gives us the history that his ear gets full of discharge, and probably sometimes the discharge is also dripping out of his ear, ma'am. Apart from that, uh, the discharge in mucosal disease is intermittent. Second is uh, the non-foul smelling and non-blood stain nature of the disease, ma'am. in the mucosal so, so these why the discharge is continuous in mucosal and scanty in squamous disease ma'am in the mucosal discharge is basically uh, due to the uh, it is that the discharge is coming from the middle ear and it is rich in the goblet cells hence the discharge quantity is generally profuse in nature whereas in the squamous disease it is due to the uh, uh, bone debris ma'am the keratin and bone debris Uh, which is uh, which is uh, degrading and put, uh, after putrefaction hence the amount remains generally remains scanty in uh, squamous disease ma'am so the patient may not even come to know that sometimes that there is a discharge he may give you what feeling of wet sensation wet sensation yes ma'am that yes wet sensation in the ear why the discharge is foul smelling in uh, squamous disease ma'am uh, the one main cause is due to putrefaction ma'am second is it can be due to uh, secondary added uh, infection by the bacteria ma'am and uh, third is ma'am due to uh, due to osteitis of the bone ma'am destruction okay, of so bone can you name to... some enzymes which are uh, responsible yes, for uh, bone lysis or yes, proteolysis ma yes ma'am the uh, uh, few main enzymes being metalloproteinase uh, caspase yes. 8 interleukins uh, interleukins apart from that ma'am uh, various uh, epidermal growth factors are responsible for this thing ma'am 
So apart from this case, like this is squamous case, but what can be the causes of blood stain discharge in an ear case? Ma'am, coming to blood stain discharge, uh, one of the most common is uh, trauma to the ear, which can lead to trauma in the EAC or can, can even lead to traumatic perforation. This can lead to uh, bloody discharge from the ear, ma'am. Apart from that, ma'am, When you said is trauma, in a case of COM, what can be the causes of blood stain discharge? Is the blood stain discharge a sacro sign with squamous disease or it can be present in mucosal as well? Ma'am, if uh, there is any uh, superadded infection in mucosal, then uh, blood stain discharge can also be presented in this uh, mucosal. Uh, patient can also give history of using uh, ear earbuds and all. Uh, leading to otitis externa which granulations can be... if granulations are there then there can be blood stain discharge blood in such discharge. cases okay why yes, is the discharge is aggravated by urti in mucosal disease ma'am uh, due to the uh, uh, action of the pharyngitis and all ma'am urti and pharyngitis uh, due to pharyngitis eustachian tube dysfunction uh, gets reduced ma'am and this leads to increased activity of goblet cells in uh, middle ear mucosa so, mm -hmm. as the name suggests, it is known as tubotympanic disease. Yes, ma'am. So, that says it all. All right. Mm -hmm. Anything else, ma'am, you want to ask? No, proceed. Also, suppose I, uh, I tell you that the age of your patient is 70 years old and he's an elderly diabetic. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And your culture has come out as pseudomal. What? Uh, with the blood stain discharge, severe pain in the ear, what would you suspect? Ma'am, malignant otitis sectional will suspect, ma'am. We'll look out for uh, severe uh, severity of the pain. And apart from that, ma'am, the worsening of the pain during the night time, ma'am. Uh, some patients typically describe it, describe it as night cry of the pain, ma'am. It gets severe to the night time, ma'am. So okay. We'll be on the outlook, so, ma'am. So when you make a uh, diagnosis, no, you give a probable, most probable diagnosis is squamosal disease. Yes, ma'am. The, the second that you can give in order is? Theum um, uh, mucosal itself, ma'am. Your uh, disease is insidious in onset. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Suppose I see you, I, I'm not telling that it is, but suppose you say that it is a tubercular otitis media. Yes, ma'am. What could yes, be the presentation? Ma'am, in the tubercular otitis media, the patient uh, complains of uh, recurrent otoria and uh, uh, recurrent painless otoria. And in the examination, ma'am, we, we, we can see this uh, type of discharge in the ear. And there can be multiple perforations which can be seen in the tympanic membrane. And uh, apart from that, ma'am... Uh, there is multiple perforation in the tympanic membrane? Ma'am, I didn't get it, ma'am. Why there is multiple perforations seen at, uh, in the tympanic membrane? Uh, um, due to the action, uh, due to the decreased Im uh, immunity of the body, ma'am, and action and virulence of the bacteria per se, uh, because of that. Is it? Or kaha multiple perforation dikhta hai? What else? Where else can you have multiple perforations? You can, can have infection. trauma, no? Trauma to the ear. Oh, you can have multiple perforations. And in tuberculosis, it is because what is the positive organism? Uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, ma'am. Yeah. So they are in the various stages of development. These tubercles, no? In the submucosal layers are in different stages. Some are matured, some are still maturing. Okay. So yes, they cause multiple perforation in the yes, submucosal layer. Okay. And then in the end, they coalesce to form a large cooperation what oh else clinical finding can you get ma'am uh, enlarged lymph nodes ma'am and uh, in the yeah, no, in the ear in the ear uh, granulation tissues can be present yeah so what what is the difference between the granulations in the tubercular otitis media and that in the squamosal variety Ma'am, it can be due to the bleeding, ma'am, like uh, squamous uh, granulation bleed more compared to the tuberculous granulation, ma'am. So, they are pale granulations. Here you have? Uh, fribal. Fleshy. Okay. Yes, fleshy. The red in color. It bleeds to ah. touch. But there you have pale granulations. Pale. And what about the, you said about that there is persistent recurrent otoria. Yes, ma'am. Painless. Visit painless. And the other thing that is? 
clinical presentation ma'am not respond uh, not responding to topical uh, drops and therapy ma'am oh, no that is okay uh, symptom wise i am asking and large lymph nodes and swelling in the neck ma'am uh, uh, hearing like loss b symptom, symptoms of tuberculosis ma'am wait uh, hearing loss aap upar dekho na camera what about hearing loss what will be the presentation of hearing matlab ma'am conductive hearing loss ma'am of the it uh, is profound disproportionate profound. to the presentation, presentation because patient is only having discharge and it is painless but yes, when you do an audiogram it will be disprop it is it will be profound hearing loss yes okay? ma'am yes ma'am can you go to the negative history slide shubhankar yes ma'am so uh, and okay so you said that the here the hearing loss is continuous so can you tell me two causes of fluctuant hearing loss ma'am in meniere's disease ma'am if it is associated with the ome then it can be uh, 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 fluctuant ma'am yes good and tell me uh, all the these negative history uh, and their association like you have said no history of fever so if fever is there what do you suspect so with each point you tell me what could be the suspicion yes, ma causes ma'am these uh, negative histories to rule out basically the complications of uh, uh, cr ma'am uh this okay. is more the intracranial as the extracranial complications are there fever can be present in any complication uh, such as ma'am involving the int intracranial variant mastoid mastoid abscess labyrinthitis uh, petrocytis they all can have a component of fever along with them apart from that ma'am uh, the intracranial complications such as uh, such as extradural abscess subdural abscess all the brain abscess and meningitis, meningitis will, also will present to us with fever ma'am what kind Neck of fever can, do you have in a brain abscess Ma'am, what is the temperature okay. actually? Do you have a high grade fever there? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Have you observed what is the pulse and what is the temperature in a brain abscess? Ma'am, uh, pulse is more and the temperature is not that high, ma'am. Not corroborating with uh, high pulse rate, ma'am. Why? With uh, these days, with the use of uh, good antibiotics, they have not seen those complications of abscess and all. What are the stages? I just, yeah, I understand. I just, yeah. I'm giving him the answer. Okay. So, can you tell me the stages of development of brain abscess? What is the first stage that you have? Um, collection of uh, collection of. Uh, not read it ma'am okay no no not read it okay it's fine autogenic brain abscess the first stage is a stage of encephalitis okay and then second is the stage of localization and organization the abscess gets organized yes, okay and the stage of development so in the development phase there can be fever and all but usually in the stage of resolution and because they will burst and the viremia and all will be there okay mm -hmm. they will the pus will drain out if it's not intervene in the correct uh, correct phase stage yes, okay so mm -hmm. you will have subnormal temperature the temperature is not high okay yes, because that uh, phase has gone the uh, organisms are liberated in the blood understood yes, yes, and you will have a thready thready pulse okay and no. what type of again again some uh, complication you have a particular characteristic of fever in uh, complicated like, CSF? Ma'am, uh, pickets and fever in lateral sinus yes. thrombocytosis, ma'am. Very good, very good. So what is that picket fence fever? What is the, how will you uh, describe it? Ma'am, he has uh, intermittent uh, high grade fever followed by uh, uh, subnormal temperature, right, ma'am? No, but it never touches the. Ma'am, spike is generally high and returning uh, spike is high during the evening time, ma'am, and it returns to baseline, ma'am, during afternoon. No, no, it doesn't touch the best. Doesn't baseline. touch the baseline. Okay, mm -hmm. that is the characteristic. It doesn't okay. uh, touch the baseline, and it again shoots up. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Right, so can you tell us some abscess related to ears? You have written swelling behind the ear. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, ma'am, uh, there are uh, multiple abscesses which are uh, associated with this swelling, ma'am. It can be zygomatic abscess along with the root of zygoma. Apart from that, ma'am, it can be lux abscess in the posterior superior natal wall, ma'am. Uh, there can be bizarre abscess in the occipital region, ma'am. Apart from that, ma'am, fetalis abscess can be there uh, behind the SEM muscle, ma'am. And very good. So now we proceed to examination findings. Ma but in the, uh, uh, in the summary, uh, in yeah. your summary, you have written. Uh, come to summary slide. Must be typing error. You have written the discharge is non spawn milling and non blood stained. Sorry, ma'am. Okay, can you? Ma'am, ma you want to ask something? Yeah. You were saying something? Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Shubhankar, Dr. Abha, Dr. Um, uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. I just uh, uh, just noticed that he said uh, bizarre abscess uh, swelling in the occipital area. So I just wanted to. Um, Again, ask him where would the bizarre abscess be located? Relation to which muscle will be the bizarre abscess? Sternocleidomastoid. Yeah, I thought you said uh, it is in the occipital area, and the citalis abscess is in relation to the sternocleidomastoid. Yeah, so okay. I just want to correct you that bizarre abscess uh, uh, is in the relation to the sternocleidomastoid uh, yes, in front anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. Ma Citalis is in relation to diagastric muscles. Okay, so come to examination findings now. And my patient is conscious, cooperative, well oriented to time, place, and person. He is averagely built and nourished, afebrile, pulse is 82 per minute, regular, and blood pressure is 126 by 76 mm of Hg, right arm supine, respiratory rate of 20 per minute. And there is no pallor, ictus, clubbing, cyanosis, pedal edema, or lymphadenopathy. Systemic examination, CVS examination. Wait, 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 wait. Go back. So, what is the clinical significance of examining pallor in a ear case? Ma'am, uh, shall we ask him to take all the examination and ask the question at the end? Okay, okay, as you wish. We'll, uh, let him finish, and then we'll we can ask him questions. Okay. Coming to systemic examination, uh, in, the CV, uh, in the cardiovascular examination, uh, S1 and S2 were heard, no murmurs were appreciated. Coming to respiratory examination, bilateral air entry was equal without any additional sounds. GI examination, there was no organomegaly and abdomen was soft and non-tender. Coming to CNS examination, he was oriented to time, place and person, no sensory motor deficit, higher mental functions were within normal limit, ma'am. Coming to local examination, ma'am, ear examination. Ma'am. Uh, uh, coming to the could interrupt. we will uh, do this in detail just uh, we should finish off with your uh, that part okay yes ma'am you go back to your so just tell me what is the clinical significance of pallor examination of pallor yes ma'am uh, ma'am first thing is that if there is pallor ma'am so there will be anemia associated anemia and this can be associated with delayed wound healing ma'am if you operate the patient second is pallor is associated with lateral sinus thrombophlebitis ma'am it is seen in uh, this complication ma'am so why why there is pallor in lateral sinus thrombophlebitis what is the reasoning behind sorry ma'am i what happens? What what is the pathophysiology in a lateral sinus thrombophlebitis? What um, happens? Complication of uh, uh, chronic otitis media, ma'am. And yes, uh, very good. so, what exactly happens? So there is thrombophlebitis and there is thrombus formation. Formation. Yes, so why uh, why there will be pallor? Uh, ma'am. Uh, like uh, the the blood starts uh, coagulating over there. So, which type of coagulopathy is there? All the that there is consumption, coagulopathy. All the coagulopathy. factors that are there, which yes, lead to the thrombus formation, they are consumed up. Yes, okay. And then there is pallor in there. Yes, okay. ma'am. Ma'am. Okay. 
coming to local examination ma'am in the pre auricular region of the ear ma'am pre auricular region no abnormality detected pinna no abnormality detected in the post auricular region no abnormality detected mastoid no abnormality detected in the external auditory canal no abnormality detected in the right side and in the left side there was foul smelling discharge present in the canal which we had to clean to see the tympanic membrane ma'am Okay, you have finished with pre-auricular, post-auricular, and then you have come to external auditory canal. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm okay. coming coming so, to the yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Continue. Coming to the tympanic membrane uh, finding, ma'am. This is the autoendoscopy finding of the left ear, ma'am. The main affected ear for which the patient came to complain. Um, uh, this is the lateral process of uh, malleus, ma'am. Handle of malleus. This is the anterior malleolar fold. Posterior malleolar fold, the annulus which seems uh, prominent. This this is present in the past tense, ma'am. Ma Tympanosclerotic patch can be seen in the uh, in the posto inferior quadrant. There is a shallow retraction also seen in the past tense, ma'am. And there was uh, no movement on cicalization in the past tense, ma'am. Suggestive of grade four retraction, ma'am. Uh, coming uh, coming to the attic region, the attic region is eroded, ma'am. And there was uh, cholestatoma debris present in attic region which we uh, tried to clean by suction still uh, the entire cavity could not be cleaned and uh, such type of uh, grade 4 grade 4 uh, retraction of pars flaccida ma'am can you classify uh, the pars tensor pars flaccida retraction yes ma'am ma'am in the pars flaccida ma'am this uh, pars flaccida uh, classification uh, retraction is given by uh, toss classification ma'am it's again given in uh, four grades the first, uh, the grade one is uh, attic dimpling. The grade two is uh, retraction of pars flaccida and it drapes over the neck of malleus, ma'am. In grade three, uh, there is uh, in grade three there is uh, bony erosion and uh, 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 there is bony erosion and we are not able to uh, scutum erosion erosion is also there and we are not able to visualize the uh, fundus clearly, ma'am. And in grade four also there is uh, entire uh, there is uh, entire bony erosion is present and we are not able to visualize the uh, fundus opening ma'am. So what is the difference between 3 and 4? Both you said the same. Yes ma'am. Ma'am grade 3 and grade 4 are uh, uh, the main difference is the whether we are able to visualize the fundus completely or not. In grade 4 we are not able to visualize the fundus whereas in grade 3 we can visualize the fundus ma'am. So there is minimal attic erosion in grade 3 and yes, it is outer it, it, it is more in case of grade 4. And past tensor? Yes. Ma'am, coming to past tensor classification, it is given by Sade's classification and uh, it's again in grade 1, 2 and grade uh, 3 and grade 4. In the grade 1, there is a past tensor retraction and cone of light is distorted, suggestive of uh, middle ear fluid being present over there. In grade 2, the past tensor is severely retracted and the tympanic membrane is uh, retracted and draped over the long process of incus. In uh, grade 3 of Sade's classification, it, uh, the tympanic membrane is retracted and it touches the promontory and uh, but ossicular chain uh, status is intact and in the grade 4 there is uh, uh, adhesive otitis media ma'am and uh, the, the tympanic membrane is entirely uh, ad adhered and draped over the promontory uh, and uh, without any movement on sigilization or valsalva ma'am. So in grade 3 it is mobile on sigilization and grade 4 it is not mobile. Yes ma'am. Alright. So how will you differentiate between a retraction and a perforation? If it is a grade 4 retraction yes, and if it is a perforation, how will you differentiate between the two? Ma'am, one is we can do a autoendoscopy and uh, try to uh, look at it. Otherwise, we can also do a powder insufflation test, ma'am. And uh, we can insufflate some uh, boric acid powder. And uh, whatever the surface which is in contact with the middle ear, that powder will get stuck over there. And hence, we can differentiate between the uh, two, ma'am. Very good. Okay, right ear finding? Ma'am. Coming to right ear finding, ma'am. This is the handle of malleus, umbo, lateral process of malleus, pre retraction. This did not, uh, this was moving on uh, this um, signalization, ma'am. And coming to the attic region, there is attic erosion over there. We can see this, uh, the ossicular status over there. This is the handle of, this is the head of malleus, 
and this is the long process of incus however stapes was not uh, we're not able to visualize the stapes and supra structure ma'am and there is a, a shallow retraction pocket present in this region ma'am and such type of grade 4 uh, parse uh, grade 4 parse lesser dia retraction ma'am so by seeing both the year what is very evident ma'am he might be having a central pathology because both of his uh, ears are getting affected ma'am central pathology like uh, ma'am any mass in the nasopharynx ma'am o o m e features of um, apart from that ma'am any nasal obstruction can be there ma'am uh, coexistent coexistent allergy can be there ma'am nasal mucosa but you said that there is no allergy no nose and throat complaints yes ma'am he was not having any his, uh, history per se but on examination okay. we found yes ma'am so it is obvious that he is having some uh, eustachian tube dysfunction which is affecting both his ear and that explains the hearing loss on the right side as well yes ma'am okay go ahead ma'am coming to the tuning fork test ma'am um, uh, Rennie's uh, coming to the right uh, of the right ear, ma'am. Rennie's was negative with 256 hertz and positive with 512 hertz. And uh, in the left side, Rennie's was negative with 512 hertz and positive with 1024 hertz. The Weber's test was lateralized to the left ear and absolute bone conduction was not reduced in both sides, ma'am. Okay. Maybe ask a lot of questions, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. You can ask one or two questions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, which type of Rennie's have you performed, Subhankar? Ma'am, uh, conduction threshold. Uh, th threshold. Uh, How uh, many types of Rennie's test do you, are you aware of? Ma'am, two types, ma'am. Conduction decay test and threshold decay test, ma'am. Okay. We so we perform the do? threshold, ma'am. Threshold decay, ma'am. Threshold. Okay. Okay. Very good. Suppose I say that. Uh, amongst all the uh, these three tuning forks, you have uh, only one is available. Oh, you can pick up only one to test. Which one will you prefer? Ma'am, 512 hertz, ma'am. Why? Ma'am, because the uh, the the tuning fork which are uh, which are uh, above it, ma'am, they they lead to um, uh, they lead to uh, ma'am more vibration sense is there with the 1024 hertz, whereas the frequency gets affected yes, with. The, is it opposite you have said? Do you want to repeat? Vice versa, vice versa, ma'am. The two fifty six hertz uh, tuning fork it affects us, uh, gives us more of the vibration sense, ma'am. And this uh, uh, hundred and oh, one thousand two four. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, more, yeah. yeah. So you are telling the pros and cons of one zero two four two fifty six, but you are not uh, like to the point. You should say why five hundred twelve. Yes, Ma'am, 512 hertz. It uh, forms a balance between the decay time and the uh, and the vibration sense, ma'am. Very smart. Very good. Okay. So actually, the answer is it uh, lies in the speech frequency range. Okay. And what is the speech frequency range? Ma'am, uh, 500 hertz to 2000 hertz. You should be confident. What is yes, the speech frequency range? Ma'am, 500 hertz to 2000 hertz, ma'am. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, go ahead with the uh, Weber's test was lateralized to the left. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, you have performed a Rini's Weber's as well as ABC. Which amongst all the three is the most sensitive one and why? Ma'am, Weber's test is the most sensitive, ma'am, as it uh, the minimum uh, the hearing loss which it uh, deviates is seven decibel itself. In the loss of five to seven decibel, it goes towards the more conductive type. Whereas for Rennie's, it needs at least fifteen to twenty decibels for the two fifty six hertz to get negative, ma'am. So you can also assess the degree of hearing loss based on these tuning fork findings. Yes, ma'am. All right, ma'am. So Weber, where did you put your tuning fork? Where all you can put the base of the tuning fork for to perform a Weber test? Uh, Tuning fork, uh, this uh, for Weber's, we can place it in, in any central region. It can be placed on the vertex. It can be placed over this uh, forehead, ma'am. It can be placed over the incisors also. And incisors being the most sensitive part, ma'am. Okay. What is Bing what? test? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, Bing test is it? a... Yes, ma'am. It's a modification of absolute bone conduction test itself, ma'am. In this, we don't press the tragus of the patient while... Uh, uh, while doing the hearing, while doing the test, and it con and it uh, conducts a bone. It's a type of test for uh, conducting bone conduction only, ma'am. 
shall we move to the next slide so one hold on hold on what yes, is uh, what is the equivocal release ma'am when uh, there is no hearing loss ma'am so the patient can say that he is able to uh, hear it uh, for both equal intensity in uh, equal intensity ma'am and we are not able to decipher whether it's uh, any positive or negative ma'am means what about air conduction and bone conduction um, air conduction is more than bone conduction or bone conduction is more than air conduction what what is it equivocal release Sorry, ma'am. I haven't heard. Where do we find it? Actually, in equi, it is found in mild, mild degree of hearing loss, conductive hearing loss, like serous otitis media. Okay, mild right. type of. Right, okay, AC is equal to yeah. BC. BC. Okay. Right, okay. ma'am. What is wandering Weber's? What do you mean by wandering Weber's? And where do you have? Um, the Weber can let life to either of the ear, not not See, uh, particularly. Normally, normally, where does the Weber lateralizes? Towards the conductive hearing loss component, where there is more the conductive. Side, conductive component. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Suppose Different for said, conductive and SN loss, no? So you should tell. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Suppose I said that conductive and SN loss. Yes, ma'am. Suppose I say that it is unilateral sensory uh, neural hearing loss. Where will the Weber lateralize? Ma'am, away from the sensory neural hearing loss, ma'am. Towards the uh, better ear, ma'am. Away from Normal the ear. Ear, Suppose yes. it is bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Where will it lateralize? Ma'am, better, better to the better ear, ma'am. No, no. It is equal decibel intense uh, degree of hearing. Uh, sensory neural component is there. Severe both ears. Ma it will remain in the center, ma'am. It will. Yeah, uh, very good. And if it center, is, if it is, suppose I say right ear has. More of sensory neural component and less ear has less of sensory neural component. Where will the Weber's lateral to the left side, ma'am? Uh, to very the lesser sensory Very time. good, very good. So, what is wandering Weber's? Um, uh, the because this wandering Weber that it can uh, uh, it can wander to either of the side. Uh, to the hearing loss, which is better, that is uh, less less uh, away from SNHL and towards the conductive hearing loss, ma'am. No, what happens? How does it happen? When do you have this? I mean, case of fluctuating hearing loss. No, it is in unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. And if you strike the yes, uh, tuning fork too hard, overtones are produced. Okay, no. so because yes, of the recruitment phenomena, it keeps wandering and then at last towards the normal ear. Yes, Understood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, you can go ahead. I think we are running short of time, so you finish your presentation. We'll last question at the end. Ma'am, coming to the auto neurological examination, the fistula test was negative. The cranial nerve examinations, including the facial nerve, no abnormality detected. Gait of the patient was normal. No spontaneous nystagmus. Rhomberg's negative. There were no cerebellar signs and no focal neurological signs. Coming to the nose examination, there was no external nasal deformity. On anterior rhinoscopy, there was col uh, the columella was normal. On lifting the columella, the vestibule appeared normal on both sides. Nasal septum was central. However, there was a spur present on the right side at the level of inferior turbinate. Bilateral inferior, inferior turbinates were normal. Nasal mucosa normal. And there was no mass or polyp seen. This is the video of nasal endoscopy which we did on the patient. We did this endoscopy uh, by a Actually, zero degree. It's okay. We know the findings. So, like you have already told this, only a spur is there. So, skip this slide. Ma'am, adenoid hypertrophy was also there, ma'am, which we found okay. out. Okay. Okay. Right, ma'am. Uh, coming to the cold spatula test, I think was... this is irrelevant in your ear. This is do yeah. does matter, but we should discuss more of your ear case. Yes, yeah, because we have anything uh, we'll more discuss more of. Yes, ma'am. Anything more in line? Uh, nil, ma'am. Any examination? No, ma'am. 
Okay, so do, do, have you done uh, neck examination in this apart from the cervical lymphadenopathy that I could find in the general examination part? Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. But no significant finding, ma'am. No neck what swelling. How no... will examine? How does neck matter in a ear case? Ma'am. What all positive findings can you have? Ma'am, uh, there can be uh, there can be any swelling or uh, swelling or abscess formation result like a complications of COM which we discussed, ma'am. Which type of abscess will you find in the neck? Ma'am, uh, this cetylis abscess can be there, ma'am. In the di Where digastric. Is found? Ma'am, digastric muscle uh, beneath the digastric muscle, ma'am. Apart from that, ma'am, any um, lymphadenopathy can be there, ma'am. Vessels, what, what about Bezor's abscess? Bezor we discussed, no. It is in relation to which muscle? Ma'am, Bezor's is SCM, ma'am. Restoral clitomastoid muscle, ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. lymphadenopathy you told. Which which yes, condition will have lymphadenopathy in here? Ma'am, ma uh, in, in tubercular otitis media can have lymphadenopathy, ma'am. And uh, in... And uh, just it? No, ma'am. Or can Ma'am, in... In any added super added infective infective case, ma'am, in uh, COM, ma'am. Malignancy of EAC, ma'am. Yes. Malignancy okay. of EAC. You yes, can have the, those lymph nodes there. Okay. Anything more in neck you can examine related to the ear COM, especially. Ma'am, neck spasm, neck rigidity can be examined, ma'am. Should be examined, ma'am. Okay. Complication. Of like complication of meningitis, ma'am. Ma Which sign uh, do you elicit? Ma'am, Koenig sign and Brusinski signs, ma'am. This we very have to elicit. Good, very good, Suvankar. Then, uh, what more? Which complication? One more complication? Which you measure some pressure and all? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, this is a uh, sign called as Quickenstein Quicken sign or Toynbee's uh, sign. We press the IGV and leading to increase in the ICP, ma'am. So, raise intracranial pressure we do. Pressure. What happens in... Uh, Thromboflevitis, thrombo, uh, this lateral sinus thromboflevitis. What complication can you have? Ma'am, IGB thrombosis can be there, ma'am. Very good. So, how does it, uh, how do you uh, appear like when you palpate? What do you find? IGB is like? Ma'am, uh, cord like thread. Uh... Cord like structure. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. So, okay. So, how will you manage this case? Ma'am, uh, first of all, I would like to further investigate this patient, ma'am. I'd like to investigate and uh, first of all, ma'am, uh, I'd like to do an examination under uh, microscope, ma'am. And uh, to confirm my findings, to clean the ear, ma'am, to take samples from, uh, if any pus is available, we'll take samples from that cavity and send for culture, ma'am. And um, we'll examine the extent of polystotoma over there. We can uh, remove Why do you want to do auto microscopy? You have already done endoscopy and seen the finding. What is the advantage of uh, or disadvantage of auto microscope? Ma'am, uh, microscope provides an uh, in-depth view of, uh, of the lesion, ma'am, which we cannot have in the endoscope, ma'am. Secondly, ma'am, we can take samples. We can do cleaning along with that, ma'am. Of uh, this that is micro. You can do in endoscope as well, no? You can do cleaning. Micro... You can take samples. Ma'am, micro. What is the main advantage? Micro suctioning can be done, ma'am. And uh... suctioning you can do in endoscope as well. What is the one most important advantage? You assess the ear as if you were uh, going operating. To operate, operate, ma'am. You'll be operating in the same situation. So, yes, and your what is handedness? Your both hands are free or both hands are endoscope? free, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, in the yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So when you said you'll do auto microscopy, then then ma'am we'll do a uh, audiometry examination of the patient. Ma'am, PTA we'll do a pure tone audiometry, ma'am. Uh, for, for pure tone audiometry, we will confirm our hearing loss, degree of fever, hearing loss, and most important, ma'am, we'll document the hearing loss. Uh, like it's a uh, part of medical legal implication as well. And uh, as far as for the future reference, it can be a baseline. Uh, so hence, it PTA can be the medical legal thing in a, a squamous disease. Ma'am, because this disease is known for recurrence, ma'am. So, hence, we should uh, keep all things documented, especially the... hearing matter? When you are, uh, suppose, you definitely you will operate upon this patient? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, is it the audiogram going to help you? 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, like when the patient will come for. Consult the patient regarding something based upon your uh, audiogram. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can. We have to counsel him regarding the hearing, ma'am. That we will operate him for eradicating the disease per se. That will be the prime aim. Hearing, hearing, and hearing reconstruction will be the secondary aim, ma'am. So yeah, this we have to counsel but the patient. Suppose I feel, I feel, if I give you a hypothetical scenario, like patient is having extensive on CT scan imaging you have done. There is gross erosion of tegment, sinus plate, and all. Okay, but when yes, you see the audiogram. It is only mild or moderate conductive hearing, which you would have expected much more. So, will you tell the patient uh, if you are going to operate upon? Will you counsel regarding something? Yes, ma'am. Uh, he can be a case of cholestatoma hearer, ma'am. So yeah. we have to tell yeah. him so that the hearing will go down after surgery. Might yeah. worsen. It may worsen. Okay, yes, because he may. You can have a medical legal aspect because you you haven't explained on documentation. You are having a mild conductive hearing loss. Yes, ma'am. How will you explain the patient? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So what you have done you audiological do? investigation. What else you will do? Ma'am, we'll like to do radiological investigation, ma'am. Uh, high resolution CT scan of the temporal bone should be done, ma'am. Thickness? Uh, How much thickness? Ma'am, uh, 0.6 mm sliced will be enough, ma'am. Yes. So and why do you want to do CT, HR CT scan yes, in a case of your... First of all, ma'am, like uh, we are planning to operate on the patient. So it will help us in our surgical planning, first thing, ma'am. Secondly, ma'am, it will help us in ruling out any anatomical variation that can be present in the patient, which might present during the surgery, uh, such as, ma'am, uh, uh, course of facial nerve, and high rise of jugular bulb, all these things can be uh, uh, seen on the CT beforehand itself. Apart from that, ma'am, uh, to know the extent of the disease, extent of the cholestatoma, what all structures it is involving, we, uh, we need to do a scan. Apart from that, ma'am, ossicular status and uh, uh, whether it, they are eroded or not, uh, this can be known so in the... So you can plan system. your surgery accordingly. So yes, what will you do in this case? Which surgery will perform in this case? Ma'am, uh, we'll first of all we'll counsel the we'll uh, counsel the patient regarding the surgery. We'll uh, go for pre anesthesia checkup and uh, we'll explain him uh, about the surgery. Uh, You've done management. everything. I'm asking you direct question: Which surgery you will do in this case? Ma'am, uh, coming to my experience and expertise, ma'am, I would like to do a canal wall down mastectomy uh, along with a tympanoplasty, ma'am, for this patient, ma'am. Why? What is the advantage? What is the other type of uh, mastectomy you know of? Um, canal wall up mastectomy, ma'am. What is the difference between both the type of mastectomy? And the bony EAC wall that is uh, brought down in this uh, canal wall down mastectomy, ma'am. So it helps in a better visualizing the cavity uh, for uh, for some people, ma'am, and uh, better clearance. So what are the disease. absolute indications of canal wall mastectomy down mastectomy? Ma'am, if the bony wall is eroded uh, more than uh, more than two thirds of the bony wall is eroded, that's an absolute indication for uh, uh, this canal wall down. Apart from that, ma'am, in surgery, tomorrow, uh, and any complications, ma'am? Complicate any complications of CM is there? Complicated CM squamous disease. Yes, ma'am. You said vision CM squamous, uh, and you said uh, already eroded. Bony ESC wall and pediatric. Uh, ma'am, your voice. I... Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, and only hearing ear. Only hearing ear. Also one of the indication. Yes, what are the disadvantages of doing canal wall down mastectomy? Ma'am, uh, uh, first of all, there is a uh, caloric uh, caloric effect which we give to the patient, ma'am. And uh, secondly, ma'am, regular cleaning is required for this uh, uh, for this cavity, ma'am. So there are four Ds. Can you tell all the four Ds? Ma'am, uh, apart from that, ma'am, debris can get deposited in the cavity, and there is it's deformity. Not, is it dependency on doctor? B yes, one D is dependency. Second D. Um, one dizziness device, you have told. Uh, second of dizziness. Discharge. Yes, ma'am. So, what are the conditions when you can have persistent discharge in spite of doing canal wall down mastectomy? 
what are the causes of persistent discharge in a case of canal wall down mastectomy ma'am ma'am uh, first of all is a is a recurrence of the disease ma'am uh, some uh, residual cholecystoma or residual disease would have been left behind which can lead to uh, recurrent discharge ma'am uh, what are the places where you are likely to leave cholecystoma or difficult to access areas yes ma'am in areas such as ma'am uh, in areas such as sinus tympani ma'am along the foot plate uh, of stapes ma'am Uh, and uh, along the semicircular canals, ma'am, uh, this uh, cholecystoma is likely to be left behind, ma'am. Not around semicircular canal. Facial rashes. Uh, facial rashes, ma'am. What else? And ma'am, apart from that, ma'am, uh, supratubal rashes, ma'am. Supratubal rashes, mastoid tip, sinodural angle. These are the areas where you are likely to likely leave. To and what is the ideal mastoid cavity? Ma'am, ideal mastoid cavity uh, should be a sauterized cavity without any irregular edges, ma'am, and it should be a self-cleaning cavity. And uh, what is and the system perfect? Okay, okay, yes, okay. Ma proceed. Proceed. Answer, ma'am's question. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, in the sump effect, ma'am, uh, the 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 cavity, the uh, the floor of the cavity is lesser than the uh, floor of EAC, ma'am. what could be she asked what could be the causes of persistent discharge in an operated mastoid cavity can you name them ma'am ma'am uh, one is uh, uh, you said yeah. recurrent and residual yeah. cholecystoma yes ma'am okay so my uh, question is what is recidivism ma'am recidivism is a, a combination of recurrence as well as uh, residual cholecystoma ma'am when do you say it as residual and when do you say it as recurrence Ma'am, uh, ma'am, uh, in the uh, recurrence is when we are sure that we have removed uh, all the uh, entire sac of cholecystoma and still the patient develops. This is recurrence, ma'am. And residual is uh, leaving behind. And we have left. It. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The patient will the next will have next a discharge year. free period in case of recurrence. Ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, what could be the second reason for persistent ear discharge? Something to do with ridge bridge, anything? Ma'am was asking. You were telling the level of floor and something like that. Some perfect, ma'am. Ma Can you the... be more specific? High, high, high facial, facial ridge. High facial ridge. High facial ridge. High facial ridge. So and then the third. And apart from that, ma'am, uh, ma'am, residual. Uh, anything to do with. The... Meatus, you do anything? Ma'am, meatoplasty, ma'am. So if you have done inadequate meatoplasty, meatoplasty, then it can happen. Suppose if you have done incomplete surgery, okay. Suppose the yes, patient is having petrositis, and you have just operated, you have treated for mastoiditis. Yes, ma'am. Incomplete. You surgery. haven't catered to the petrous apex. Ma'am. Okay, then he yes, can have persistent ear discharge. Yes, ma'am. Suppose patient is having underlying allergy etiology. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can't correct it. Pers patient is having eustachian tube dysfunction. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Severe eustachian tube dysfunction. So these all causes could be leading to persistent ear discharge. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I think we can just ask one or two questions because we already up on time. So. The problems of large mastoid cavity, as it happens in canal wall down mastoidectomy. So, can you tell us what can we do to avoid these problems? Can you do something with the cavity so that the size yes, of the cavity reduces? Ma'am, uh, we can do mastoid obliteration, ma'am, and we can reconstruct it, ma'am. So, how can you do obliteration? Ma'am, we can uh, various flaps we can use uh, musculoperiosteal flap, which can be anteriorly based or superiorly based flaps can be used, ma'am. And hence, anything uh, else other than flap, ma'am. Uh, apart from that, ma'am, uh, certain materials such as uh, cartilage or uh, 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 Teflon or floral soft tissue can be used, ma'am, to fill the cavity. Five materials they can also be used to used reduce the, the size of the cavity. Cavity, ma'am. All right. So, Shubhankar, well done. And any other questions, Nilima, ma'am? You want to ask something? Uh, Namneet. Hello, Prabha. 
Yeah, so we are done with the time and the presentation. Maybe we can uh, stop this. Okay, can we uh, address a few questions? I can see two questions in the chat box. If you can just address these. That question was uh, Madhupriya, ma'am. So she has asked what so we have to write down here. Maybe Madhu ma'am is not there. She can uh, write this, uh, convey this later on. This question was asked by her. All right, then we uh, very good presentation. Nice session. Sound is not clear. So we can. Uh, I think we are done, Namni. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Dr. Shubhankar Tiwari for the presentation and thank you very much, Dr. Abha Kumari, Dr. Madhu thank you so much. and uh, Dr. Nilima Gupta for joining us. And thank you, trainees, for joining. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.